Thank you. JT did a great job of kind of outlining what drives price, what creates volatility, what are the factors, if we look backwards, that cause it, and the extreme difficulty of predicting what's going to happen in the future as far as forecasting price. Um, so my title here is Adapt to Volatility. You guys haven't always had extreme volatility here, but you do now. Your environment has changed. So that's why I put ADAPT up there. And a good quote that I like to think about is from a guy that knows a lot about adapting, Charles Darwin. It's not the strongest that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. Well, did you guys all hear that? That was a great moment I just had. You all missed it. Uh, it's the ones most responsive to change that are most likely to survive. Sorry? How about now? Is that, is that good? Okay. It's the ones most responsive to change that are most likely to survive. Okay? And the good news there is you don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the strongest. You just have to recognize that change is here and adapt. So I'm going to talk to you about what is volatility and what is hedging. What's your challenge? What's your opportunity? Uh, hedging as the business practice that it is. And knowing what I know, what would I do if I was in your shoes? Um, so a bit about me. Um, I'm not a dairy farmer, so I don't have that in common with you. But I do own a family business, like a lot of you do. Um, so I feel the same kind of pressures. And the business I'm in is brokerage and trading of dairy markets. I started it in 2002 uh, by myself. And today we're a firm of 28 people. And a lot of that growth is just because the need for dairy risk management is growing so fast. Uh, it happened in the US. We're starting to see it happen in Europe, where we set up an office in London last year. Um, and I believe it's happening here as well, OK? Um, that's the reason NZX is setting up futures. That's the reason you're seeing things like GDT launch. Um, and like yourselves, I put this up here, you may not be super excited about learning about risk management. You might be saying you don't want to take on another responsibility. I feel the same way about having to adapt to compliance changes in my world or having to deal with HR. There's a lot of things that I don't love. They're not my core in my business, but I have to do them if I'm going to survive. So what is volatility? It's uh, used a lot. It's the reason we're here. But this is the definition, tending to vary often or widely as in price. It doesn't mean low prices. Volatility does not mean low. Volatility doesn't mean high. It means it's moving around quite a bit. That's volatility. That probably looks familiar to some of you. Right? It, when it's high, volatility is great for you, not for end users. But when it's high, it's great. The, the nature of volatility is just that it moves around a lot. That's the challenge. Um, what is a hedge? A hedge is an investment to reduce risk of adverse price movements in an asset. We'll go through this further. Okay? The, further, normally a hedge consists of taking an offsetting position in a related security such as a futures contract. When we talk about price risk management, you hear people use that term. It's interchangeable with hedging. Hedging and price risk management are the same thing. This is your challenge. It's also your opportunity. Volatility is your challenge and it's your opportunity. OK? And you could say, where's the opportunity in this? Um, the first opportunity is surviving. That's always the first trick. Uh, you're in a new environment, and hedging is something that will make you more resilient in this environment. The good news is this is not unique, and it's not new, in that volatility has been around for a long time, centuries, and businesses have learned how to cope with this. It's universal. Tens of thousands of businesses trade trillions of dollars every day in the world's financial markets to hedge their risk. Includes farms. This is not just big businesses. This is farms of all types. Corn, cattle, oranges, rice, hogs, coffee, sugar, 
wheat, et cetera, et cetera. Farmers around the world that are subject to volatility, they use hedging. Hedging, as we know, it was born in ag markets. Talk more about that later. Um, as an example, you could Google thousands of companies out there, but I'll pick on ADM for, to start us off here. Partly it's a company that I use. Uh, they're in a volatile market. They're, they process grain and oil seeds. Um, but they're 100 years old. They've learned how to survive in a business that is reliant on volatile commodities. Okay? And as big as they are at $100 billion a year of annual revenue, they don't control the grain price. That's way beyond their scope. Okay? They've got the humility to understand that as big as they are, grain is way beyond them. Even though they're a big player in that market, they're, they don't control the whole market. And grain is influenced by things beyond grain, like the dollar, like oil, as JT outlined. It's not just about one singular market. It goes outside your market. So what do they do? You can Google this stuff, look in their annual report if you're prone to do that type of thing. The company manages ex its exposure to adverse price movements of agricultural commodities by entering into derivative and non-derivative contracts, futures, options, they hedge. Okay? They can't control it, they're subject to volatility, so they hedge. It's not just agricultural companies. Apple is operating around the world, so therefore they've got a lot of currency risk in the US dollar. Even though they're the world's most valuable company, they don't control the US dollar. And yet their profits are dependent upon a stable US dollar, so they stabilize it by hedging. It's not just American companies either. It's all around the world, even here in New Zealand. New Zealand companies do this. Meridian is your lar largest power generator. Look in their annual statements, they talk about what they hedge. I could do this thousands of times over. And it's not just publicly traded companies that do this. I pick on them because I can Google this stuff. Um, if I were to talk to the thousands of farmers around the world that employ hedging, they would have policies too, but not something I can Google. Okay? So hedging is universal. Doesn't matter what the asset is that you're in, whether it's iron or the dollar or milk or copper, if you're in that business and your profit is dependent upon a really risky or volatile asset, people hedge, okay? So what is hedging? Uh, this is the guts of it. This is the philosophy of hedging, okay? And it's, people get very confused. They hear about it, they think it's risky. So I'm gonna break it down here. Futures contracts are used to manage exposure to pre-existing risk. People use futures contracts to hedge pre-existing risk. So in a dairy farm, what is your pre-existing risk? It's that the price of milk goes down. It's that your input costs go up. You have pre-existing risk in your business. So that's what you use the contracts for, to hedge that risk. The use of futures contracts to manage price risk is a defensive action. It's the opposite of gambling. It's a hard one. You guys hear that and intuitively you think that's not true. But it's the truth. It's the opposite of gambling. A company, a dairy farm, takes a position in futures that's opposite and equal to its price exposure in the physical market. Opposite and equal. So NZX is about to list a futures contract that's 6,000 kgs of milk solids, settling to the Fonterra farm gate price. If you make 200,000 kgs of milk a year, you would sell about 30 of those futures contracts to equal about 200,000 kgs. And because it's gonna to settle to the Fonterra farm gate pay price, that's what makes it equal and opposite. Okay, if you were to use a different kind of a futures contract in Japanese yen futures or something totally unrelated, that would not be equal and opposite. Okay, that would not be a hedge. So a hedge is finding that instrument, that futures contract or that forward contract that matches your risk. Equal and opposite. People do this to capture a profit. You know, it says in there too, it could be limiting a loss, it could be a holding opportunity, but really, this is about capturing a profit, okay? 
you look out into the future, you see a futures price, and you think you know your input costs, and if it represents a profit, that's, that's your driver for locking it in. That's why businesses like Kraft and Nestle use futures contracts. They're managing their profit margins. They're not speculating. Your goal of this financial trade is not to make money on the financial trade. Your goal of the trade is to reduce your risk of a loss or increase your odds of, of a profit. And this is where a lot of people get lost too. They open an account and they put a position on and let's say they sold milk at $5 and then milk goes up to seven. And they think, oh God, I lost. Well, the reason they locked in at five was to guarantee a profit. They achieved their goal. Uh, some people get confused and they start to think, I'm supposed to make money on my financial position. That's not the goal of hedging. If you do want to make more money on your financial position, that's called speculation or investing. It's a different practice than hedging. So hedging and investing or speculation are two different endeavors. I highlight this one. It's the opposite of gambling. People get confused on this one. I think it's because people that are trading or speculating or investing are using the same kind of instruments that hedgers use. So they tend to think that anybody that's using that stuff is gambling. Bottom line, any position that you take, any financial position that you take, can be measured this simply. If the position decreases your risk, it's a hedge. If it increases your risk, it's a speculation. So here's where I get into a couple candid observations. I've been to New Zealand about 10 times. Um, and as I got invited to come talk to you guys about this, a couple things stuck out to me. The first one is that I got the sense that people thought, hey, Fonterra already does this for me. They already manage, they hedge for me. And my observation is that they don't. Otherwise, you wouldn't have that milk chart that looked the way it did. Fonterra does take on hedging activities, but that does not eliminate your price risk. Sorry, I see sad faces, but I feel compelled to tell you this because it's, <laughs> it's as true as I, I can tell. Um, the second truth that I think is important, Fonterra and New Zealand are critically important in the global dairy value chain. Don't mistake that with the idea that they control the price. They've had amazing success launching global dairy, uh, global dairy trade, GDT, um, but that's a mechanism. That's a price discovery venue. It's not a price controlling venue, okay? The global dairy industry is $500 billion a year, half a trillion dollar per year industry. New Zealand is about 5% of that. You know, Europe is the biggest milk shed on earth and they're only 30% of it. They don't control it either. Nobody does. Okay, so it's out of your control. Takeaways here, Kiwi dairy farmers have price risk. You do, you have it. Um, and you're subject to global prices. Come on, it's not depressing, don't worry, it's okay. There are solutions to this, but this is the reality. This is where you stand today. You've got the price risk, and these markets are outside of your control. So welcome to the financial markets. This is where you're thinking, Yank, take your financial markets and shove them where the sun don't shine, right? <laughs> you're thinking, I don't want to have to learn this. I'm busy enough. I don't want to have to figure out and take on another responsibility. And I remind you again, this is your challenge. It's your opportunity. If you don't learn and practice hedging, your risk of going out of business increases. If you do learn and practice hedging, your risk of survival increases because you're in a volatile environment. And hedging is the solution, one of the solutions. I'm gonna rifle through this. The, the history of risk is really interesting, it's important, um, but the history of dairy is more important. Because if I'm in your shoes, I might be asking, why now? It's 2016, I've, I've been fine for this long, why do I have to learn hedging right now? Um, in the dairy, dairy industry, we actually started with exchange markets as early as the 1800s. The CME group was founded as a Chicago, Chicago Butter and Egg Board. Um, but in the 1930s, we had kind of a global regulation happen. Prices were frozen, frozen for 50 years. 
In the 1980s, your country, my country, and Australia all deregulated about the same time. Way too expensive for governments to try and control the price of dairy product. Totally stunted the growth of the industries. It was a bad thing. One of the results was that price was set free. It was set to supply and demand and price discovery to figure out what is the value of this stuff. And that value changes on it every day. And the U.S. reacted a little bit differently. We listed futures markets in 1993. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Partly it was in our culture. Um, we've got a deep history of having futures markets on ag commodities there. But really the biggest thing was is we got subjected to volatility instantaneously. We were largely a domestic market at that time. Today we export about 25% of what we produce in the U.S. Back then we exported maybe 5% and that was all subsidized export. Okay, so we were a domestic market and our volatility hit us right away. It didn't hit New Zealand right away because New Zealand was in the global market competing against Europe and Europe had not deregulated yet. So global prices were still pretty frozen during that time until Europe started deregulating. The world market started getting pretty volatile. And I would say it was around 2005 to 2007 there was really a, a global awakening in the dairy industry about this is real, this is here, um, we got to do something about it. And New Zealand and Fonterra took a pretty awesome move from my standpoint and created GDT. They said, this thing is real, it's here, let's do something about it, let's take ownership of it. Let's create a product that we can own. GDT has been way more successful than I thought it would have been. Um, and it's, it's a phenomenal auction system. 2010, Europe and New Zealand listed futures markets in dairy. Okay, there's two exchanges in Europe that dairy futures are listed on, and NCX here. 2013, GMP begins. 2016, you're going to get futures on milk. History is partly important to know. Why are we here? Why is this happening now? But also because it's an opportunity to learn from those that have come in front of you. Right, one of the greatest scientists of all time and he's giving credit to humanity before him for his accomplishments. So you got a chance to borrow ideas. You don't have, you're not starting from square one. You don't have to say, oh my God, this is volatility, I need to invent something. All you gotta do is look around you and borrow ideas, okay? This is a chance to grow your minds and grow your businesses. So if I was in your shoes, I might feel overwhelmed right now, but don't, I hope you feel energized. This is an opportunity. Don't focus on the things you can't control, right? You don't need to worry about trying to control global markets. All you gotta do is worry about controlling your costs, like JT mentioned. Being able to kind of identify what are your costs and identify your revenue and decide about if you wanna manage around that. So there's a few things I would do if I was in your shoes. And I would start by making a strategic decision if I'm gonna hedge or not hedge. Strategic decision. Don't avoid hedging as a non-decision and don't just jump in without understanding it. I would learn from US dairy farmers because they have 23 years of experience. And I stress, just learn from them as it pertains to hedging. I know you guys are very proud of your dairy production industry here as you should be. I'm not saying you have to emulate them in terms of their feeding standards or anything like that. But as it pertains to hedging, they've got a lot of experience to share. Um, focus on hedging your profit margin. We'll dive into that, not just your revenue. And pick up a couple of good best practices. Build the muscle that is required to hedge. First thing to consider when you're deciding to hedge or not to hedge is your level of leverage, right? Debt is not a bad thing, it can be a great thing, it's just an important component when you decide whether or not you're going to hedge. When prices are high, it's great. Debt is no problem. When prices go low and you're not cash flowing positive, that becomes a problem if you've got a lot of debt. Okay? In our more advanced industry here, because we've had hedging and more volatility for longer than you guys have had, one of a very experienced U.S. dairy banker that banks a great chunk of U.S. dairy farms. This is the way he looks at it. 
Now, 50% may not be relevant here. Debt levels are different. It's a slightly different industry, but the concept is the same. The higher the degree of debt, the higher the need to hedge. Very little debt, you have the luxury to say, you know what, I don't need to hedge. I can withstand two years of negative. I don't care if it digs into my equity, okay? Um, to hedge or not to hedge? What kind of business manager do you want to be? That's really a core question. Just it's a moment to kind of reflect and say, do I like to plan for outcomes or do I kind of just want to wait and see what the price might be next year? So another lesson to look at from the US, um, this is a chart of income over feed. IOFC, it's really uh, an all milk US price at a ratio to a couple of feed, major feed ingredients. It's a measure of profitability based on the big variable pieces, because feed is the big variable on the cost side in the US, and milk is the big variable on the revenue side. So one minus the other. The red zone is generally an area of loss for most US dairy farms. And I don't think 2009 was as bad in New Zealand as it was in the US, but when you talk about 2009 in the US, it puts chills down the spine of US dairy farmers. It was a horrible year. Massive equity was lost. People lost their businesses. Uh, to this day, there are people that haven't got their equity back that they lost that year. They're still fighting their way back from that. You'll notice this chart goes from 05 until 16, until current. And you remember we had futures start in 1993. So the guys that figured out hedging, starting in the late 90s and early 2000s, by the time 2009 rolled around, they were prepared. They were ready. They fared way better than their counterparts that didn't know how to hedge. It's fairly well documented. Um, what else from the US experience? They began using futures early. They started with basic strategies of selling futures. They advanced from there to using more options. Um, early adopters benefited. And I've got there that fourth bullet about, you know, stories of people who had a bad experience. It's really about having the proper expectations, which is really why I focus on the philosophy of hedging here, how it's the opposite of gambling. Um, some people went in thinking they were supposed to make money trading futures, or they were supposed to become great analysts of the dairy market and trade off of every little scrap of news. The, fo the focus needs to be hedging is risk reducing and hedging is based on your profit margins, not based on you being a super analyst in the dairy markets. Dairy farmers that hedge feel like they can grow with confidence. They don't have to guess what their profit might be next year. They don't have to guess if they're going to lose next year. I'm going to skim through this one. We, we actually had a, a bunch of policies that came out to help assist with volatility. Maybe they were market distorting. Maybe they weren't. I'm not sure. Um, one, of the, one of the easiest ones to look at was this one from 1999 to 2003. Incredibly cheap. The government said, any dairy farmer that opens a brokerage account will pay for 80% of the put option premium. That meant a dairy farmer could buy a price floor for the next year, and he only had to pay for 20% of it. What it did was it gave dairy farmers the confidence to go open that account with a broker, figure the system out, um, and then it had a sunset on it, as it should. It helped them with the education that they needed. Remarkably cheap, successful in the standpoint of hundreds of U.S. dairy farmers got into the market during this time frame, built that muscle. By the time 2009 came around, they were there to survive. This one is key. In the U.S., all the major co-ops, all the major processors have forward contracting programs as a service for their members. It's not a requirement for their members to use it, but it's a facility that's there for them to use if they want to. And it means that if their farmers want to hedge their price risk, whether they're with DFA or AgriPure or go down the list of hundreds and hundreds of the majors in the US, they all have forward contracting programs. This is what GM, GMP was. Um, 
And the U.S. didn't start out perfect either. You know, some of the forward contracting programs that exist at co-ops and processors today have evolved. They've morphed. So I personally look at GMP as your first pilot program. I thought it was really well designed, but you guys need to have another one. Another one will come for sure because it's such an important tool. Um, major benefit of a farm forward contracting program within the co-op is capital and its simplicity. We'll talk about capital in a minute, but the capital requirements for hedging on your own through a broker are huge. The co-op does that piece for you if you do it through them. The drawback of using the co-op forward contracting program is slightly less flexible. You know, GMP, you had to get in at a certain time. There's a certain offering. Futures markets are dynamic. They're open every single day. You can get in, get out. You can move your position. So in broad strokes, those are the pros and cons of the two. Where is the U.S. dairy farm today as it relates to risk management? They've got four tools to help them hedge. They've got the exchange. They've got forward contracting through their processor. They've got MPP through the government, which is an insurance program. They've got over-the-counter markets. This is who you guys are competing with to survive on the world stage. Financing is important. And I'm going to talk through this one a little bit more carefully. I got kind of rushed yesterday, and I <laughs> freaked out the crowd when I talked about this one. Um, Remember, in a co-op forward contract, such as GMP, the co-op does this piece for you. But if you open an account with a broker, you have to post margin for your futures contracts. It can be a lot of money. Example, an NZX future is 6,000 kgs. Imagine the price is five bucks a ton. That's about $30,000 worth of milk. Let's say the NZX posts a margin requirement of 10%, which is realistic. That's gonna be about $3,000 per contract that you have to put up. But that's the small part. That's not a cost. That's a bond you have to post in order to take that position on, okay? In addition to posting that, I'm not going to go into standard deviations, but this is the rule of thumb. You should have about two of them handy. That's about $2.50 per kg, or about $15,000 on one futures contract. So $15,000 plus $3,000, you need about $18,000 handy just to hedge 6,000 kgs. Bottom line, if you're making 210, that's 35 futures contracts, that's $630,000. You need to be prepared to post in margin. Now, we were talking about this last night, how I freak people out. The important thing to know is this goes both ways. If you hedge it at five bucks, 35 contracts, and it goes to 750, those two standard deviations, that money's gonna be required and it's gonna be required before it's paid to you in your milk check, okay? If it goes the other way, if you hedge at 750 and it goes down to five bucks, you've got 630 grand of cash in your account that you can do what you want with. It cash flows in real time both ways, okay? This is the kind of thing you do not wanna be surprised by. You plan for it beforehand. And when I go back to the American experience, the way we have planned for that, Every single dairy farm account that I have, which are hundreds at Rice Dairy, we have a hedge line of credit in place with them. Okay, this has become standard operating procedure in the US, where the banker has a two-page agreement with my clearinghouse ADM that says anytime this farm account has a margin call, the bank is gonna send money in. What do they do? They set up a separate line of credit specifically for hedging. Because they understand that hedging is a risk-reducing thing it's good for them. So they actually will increase the leverage, they'll increase the debt to finance a hedge account. It's not only a win for the dairy farmer to have this hedge line of credit set up, the bank gets an underlying loan that becomes more stable because as we, as we talked about, uh, academics reflect that accounts that hedge and hedge properly are more durable more likely to survive, therefore less of a credit risk. The bank gets that and they get an extra loan out of it. It's a win-win. Questions on this? Yeah. In, in the US, you're obviously talking about hedging the income side, you match off and hedge the expense side. We do. We don't have that in New Zealand. We do. 
Well, let me dive into that, because that's actually right what I'm going into next. Yes, we do. I'll just dive into that here. It's all about the margin. We hedge both sides, and I think there's an opportunity for you to do it here, too. And I'll kind of show you how about that. Cost of production is key. It's really about what are your, what are your big variable pieces? My other feedback is I was supposed to start with this one yesterday because this is the one that stood out to people. So hopefully everybody's awake still. Um, we look at really aggregate risk on a U.S. dairy farm. The big piece is obviously the blue piece of the pie, that's milk. Okay, but we've got inputs and we've got your revenue on here. The green is feed. Okay, so your costs are kind of lumped in with your revenue here because this is really just a pie chart of what is your risk. Okay, and in 2009, it wasn't just the milk price collapsing that hurt them. It was the fact that feed prices stayed really high. So it went both ways on them in the U.S. Okay. New Zealand is not much different. The pie, the pieces of the pie are a little bit different. Milk is about 70%. It's still the largest portion. If you're not hedging that piece, you're not hedging much. If you're not hedging your milk, you're really not reducing your risk materially. On the cost side, the biggest piece here is interest. Um, I know there's a bit of a checkered history with hedging interest rates here, which I'm hearing stories about. But going forward, doing, using best practice, if you're being methodical about hedging your risk, interest is gonna be a big piece on the cost side, okay? So how do you turn this into something you can use, right? If this is your risk, how do you turn this into something tangible? And the way we've done it is we built software for it because this thing can be kind of complex to try and measure. It takes a lot of time. Automate it. Our answer is automate it, okay? So we built software for dairy farmers that automates all this stuff. It looks forward and figures out what are your costs on your farm, not just as a generic number. What's your revenue look like on your dairy farm, not as a generic number. We're six years into development. We've come a long way. It's U.S. focused, but we're already looking at New Zealand. It's hard. If you're going to do this on your own with pencil and paper or an Excel sheet, it's going to take you hours and hours and hours, and you're going to say, screw it. Automate it. It's very automatable. It's auto, it's, it can be automated for you guys, too. So these are the kind of tools that will be available to you, whether it's us or somebody else. These are the kind of things you want to use to help guide your hedging decisions. This is best practice. This is how ADM hedges. This is how Nestle hedges. This is how grain farmers that are three generations into it, this is how they hedge. Okay? So, volatility is here. That's your revenue line looking backward. You want to start to use, look forward and say, how, how, how do I hedge off that? There's no guarantees, there's no crystal balls, forecasts. JT makes, I'm sure, great forecasts. My company puts a lot of effort into making forecasts, tons of it. We spend a lot of money and time forecasting. Ultimately, we don't know. That's why we hedge, because we don't know what the future is going to be. We don't know what the price will be next year. So you use tools like this to give yourself the best odds of survival, to hedge off your business goals. Um, I hope you take away that hedging is vital. It's a universal business practice. It's not uh, harebrained scheme. Uh, hedging is an opportunity to grow. And we added this in here as a takeaway too. NZX is going to be listing these futures markets. They've got a section on their website, how to access the market. So if you're looking for tangible next steps, there's a lot of brokers out there that can actually give you access to the market. Uh, my company Rice Dairy is up there. My clearing firm ADM is up there. My biggest pause would be don't even open an account if you haven't figured out how you're going to finance that futures position. As we talked about, that 630k. Okay, figure that piece out first. Feel free to reach out to me, grab a business card, contact me anytime. I'm happy to work through one off with your bank to try and make that happen. Um, but don't even get started unless you've figured out that financing piece. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, we've got time for some questions, so once again, put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you. And um
The question was, can it be emailed? And the, the answer is absolutely. Uh, you can reach out to me. You can reach out to your local counselor. Yeah, Malcolm? Absolutely, though, yeah. And this one was videotaped, so I'm not sure how that would become available, but. It's all going to be on fast source, so the whole video. Farm source for the video. Um, Gary Ryan at Cambridge. Um, when you look at hedging, you know, at the end of the day, most people are going to see is, you know, you're going to have unders and overs, so there's going to be years that the hedging is advantageous and, and hedging is a, a disadvantage to your, to your business. History would show that over a 20 year period, whether you were hedged or un unhedged in any, anything, whether it be currency or interest rates or commodities, that you actually financial positions are break even. So, why would you actually bother going through that process? Really good question. Uh, the question is some years you're going to win on your hedges, some years you're going to lose. Why even bother? Um, the, the first and most simple answer is if your goal is to stabilize your cash flows, your profits, this is a way to do that. You're able to look, scan the future. You guys are gonna have five years of futures contracts listed. Five years forward. So if you think about the futures contract three years out, it's gonna be moving around. There's gonna be times where it's trading in the way lower third percentile, you know, quarter, quartile of historical pricing. There's gonna be times where it's at the highest. It's gonna give you a chance to lock in your price. You as the business manager may have a chance to make a decision that you wouldn't get otherwise. It's a question of do you want control over your profitability or do you want to just wait and see what the market might give you? The second part is that as people adopt the business practice of hedging, the art and science of hedging, you start to become good at it and you start to know how to use the tools. And we look at like futures contracts and option, options contracts. They're both hedging instruments, but they're very different types of tools. Just like a hammer is different than a screwdriver. It doesn't make one superior to the other, but at certain times, one is the right tool and one is the wrong tool, okay? And it, in a price environment like this, where you're at 390 and futures may come out at four bucks, I think maybe as high as five bucks, but whatever they're listed at, the fact of the matter is, this is at the lower area of historical pricing. So the book tells you buy puts, don't sell futures. Okay, and that's kind of a, the more nuanced answer to your question of why bother, why do you do this? Because you'll have, if you know how to use the tools the right way, you'll have the chance to give yourself greater probabilities of leaving your profit up, up when the market says you should or if you're at the way higher end of historic prices, use futures, because odds are there's more downside than upside. Season in, season out, as you get good at using these tools, you have the chance to do more than just simply lock that price in and do the same on up as, as you do on down. Uh, you, you become a skilled craftsman with the tools. I don't know if you would add anything to that, JT. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Thanks, Brian. Uh, look, I just want to add something to that. I, I, I think that part of the answer to that question is, is it depends on your business model, right? And one of the questions I think I was posing is that the business model is not necessarily the same for everybody. If you look historically, you know, at New Zealand's key lift cost in production position, we had a bunch of owner operators, right, who were passionate about farming, basically had low debt levels, knew what they were doing. We're in a position where we could drive productivity in many parts of the country through better pasture, better genetics, better water. And, you know, because we had low debt levels to the point of my charts, basically we could take the down years and reap the rewards of the, big, of, the, of the high years, right? And we were swing producers. 
this will become more relevant as we go further south, as you guys know, but you know, that's not necessarily the business model that a lot of farmers in New Zealand have, uh, have got these days. You know? I've talked about the high cost model. Well, for example, if you have a different model which has got dairy in it, it's got a much larger balance sheet because you know, you're not you know, milking 500 cows, but you're milking 1,600 cows. Um, then there's a legitimate case for saying, perhaps my business model shouldn't be just to hope that the debt's okay and ride through the tough years and I'll reap the rewards of the good years and if everything works out, I'll get a few good years before I get a few bad years. But by the way, when the good years come along, I'm gonna go and buy the farm next door, so you know, I'll mitigate the uh, benefits of that anyway. Perhaps the business model might be, you know what, I'm going to run a disciplined $4 cost based production model here, and I'm going to try and operate this on a tightly focused basis. This might sound like something I say to my partners. You know, <laughs> with a two bit, two dollar even that, you know, margin. And if that's my business model, you know, and I'm confident I can run it at four dollars, and then I see the milk futures at six dollars fifty, perhaps I want to do some hedging and to Brian's point, lock in some of that margin, right? I sleep better at night, I have certainty over my cash flows. You know, my bankers are happy. Um, you know, and I may not hedge all of it. I might do a partial hedge. I might hedge 50% of it because I want some upside. I think if I can be brutally honest, and I can hopefully say this as a farmer, and Brian can't say it, one of the things I think we have to get beyond is the psychology that says, I'm not gonna hedge at $6.50 because if it goes to $7 and I've hedged and my neighbor hasn't, I'm going to feel like an idiot and he's going to have a new Toyota and I'm going to have last year. <laughs> right? So it depends on your business model. If your business model is, I'm not going to make less than that bastard next door, then you probably don't want to hedge. Right? <laughs> if your business model is, I want to operate at $4 and I want a $2 EBITDA margin, then you should think about hedging. Does Beautiful. that not make you a speculator rather than a hedger? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me answer that. No, the, answer, the answer is no, because you're, what, all you're doing is locking in, you know, locking in your margin. You're not speculation is buying or selling something that you don't own, right? If you're selling at a fixed rate price something that you own because you're producing it, that's not speculation. Sorry, we, we so, go for a long time. So if you can build on that though, yeah. which, which I don't, don't disagree with. Um, but you talk about risk, risk of risk management. Yeah. So a real big part of that then though is, is locking in both sides or hedging both sides because if you're only hedging one side of your business, whether they're the revenue side or the cost side, you're actually exposing yourself um, once again. And so, so within New Zealand, where if you look at, um, it's different to the states, so the sixth or one of the major costs within New Zealand would be interest, yeah. that if you're gonna lock in your revenue side, you're almost bound by good, good business management to lock in the cost side as well and be an interest. Well, one of the things that Brian and I and uh, Brian and Stephen and I spent three hours discussing this at dinner last night, but, um, but you know, I did make the point to them that one of the things that does drive me crazy, and this is perhaps because my partners think I've got no expertise in farming because I'm a banker, my expertise is limited to the, uh, you know, the orange band. But they want to talk to me about hedging, our interest rate risk and nauseam, to which my response is, well, you know, you want to talk to me about interest rate risk at nauseam, but when I ring up and say we should be using GMP, yeah. you go, that's not in the cooperative spirit and you shut me down, <laughs> you know? And you want to spend 20 seconds, the discussion on the blue bits, 20 seconds, yeah. but the discussion on the orange bits, three hours, right? <laughs> and this makes $30,000 difference to my bottom line, even if I get it wrong, and this is a million bucks. So, you know, you can think about it just broadly in those terms. So, irrespective of whether you buy what Brian says, I guess part of what we want to get over today is this is worthy of a discussion, right? If, um, if nothing else. Now, to your point, the reason that the part of the reason this is different and the cost is higher is, is that, as you know, we're essentially, you know, a grass fed, particularly in Waco, you know, a grass fed farming system. So, you, you can't hitch grass, you know, in that sense. You know, you can hitch some of your other commodities, particularly if it's supplementary feed and you know people you know do buy you know the, the grain forward and the day or let's say so this days, but but you know you can hit it but but the key issue is that you 
that you can't hedge in, in New Zealand are interest, which is a high component of this. You could do some hedging around supplementary fee, but as per Brian's analysis, it's less important here than it was that it would be. And if you adopted my farming system, it would be relatively less important. But you know, we do need to have a discussion about this, right? Because this, the the content at the moment is disproportionate to the influence that uh, uh, that it has on our business model and profitability. That's that's the bottom line. We have a question from the corner. Yeah, uh, Graham Henderson. Brian, you advocated that it was a good idea for the uh, cooperative or supplying company to set up a system for their farmers to cover the margin calls. If, say, Fonterra set up a system and 50% of the hook solids was uh, hedged, what uh, percentage of capital would be required to back that? What percent would be required by Fonterra or oh, by? Yeah, you know, Fonterra's capital. Yeah, that's a great question. I think. The initial programs were a pilot program that started out as 1%. And that standard deviation exercise that I talked about, uh, I know for sure that team went through that exercise and made sure they had the capital ready. Um, I, I would say that that's at the co-op level for them to make sure that they have enough bandwidth to take that, to carry those positions. Uh, how much would that be? That's a math exercise I don't know off the top of my head. Be half of your guys' production doing that, that same math there. It would be tens of, tens of millions of dollars? Hundreds of millions, probably? Does that want to have a guess? No. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot there. Um, yeah, JT's got a thought there. So, so just on, on, on that, I mean, two things. One, one it would depend upon how Ontario was hedging it out. So if they were, in fact, doing it themselves through futures and derivatives, it would have that margin uh, capability. I mean, one of the benefits, you know, of GMP, and I'm wrong, but one of my perceptions of the benefits of GMP was that it actually also enabled Ontario to write long-term physical delivery contracts, you know, on the outside. So it's not the case that one of the benefits that you get of the cooperative doing it is, is that they have the capacity and the ability to hedge in other markets, including the CME, which, which they did. And to your point, that would have the same margin requirements here as Brian sort of talking about. But that's not their only option. They could actually do, you know, physical against physical. And so, you know, I don't think it's a, it's a linear relationship. So are you saying it would be cheaper to do it? So are you saying for, for us farmers? that it would be cheaper to do it through Fonterra than on NZX, potentially. Um, I'm trying to think of a polite way to put it, but, um, <laughs> but uh, the GMP was a very good yeah. product at a, a very good deal for farmers, which was probably rejected for the farmers. And why it was rejected, I'm not here to debate it. Um, but it was probably rejected for the wrong reasons. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah the short answer to the question, do I think it was a cheap product that was a good deal for farmers? The answer is yes, I did. It, it, in our experience in the U.S., we look at it dollar for dollar. If the dairy farm's in a hedge through the co-op or through the exchange, it's typically cheaper to do it on the exchange. So you take total costs would be commissions to the broker, all the fees, interest paid to the bank on your hedge line of credit, Net, 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 that ends up equaling, in our terms, about five cents per hundred weight. Typical co op for their forward contracting program charges about 10 cents per hundred weight. In your guys' terms, that's like one penny versus two pennies per kg. So it's slightly more expensive, typically, in my experience, to hedge through the co op. Um, but it's really about what do you get out of that? You don't have to worry about managing that margin requirement. That, that's, and that's my experience in the U.S. That's not to say that Fonterra versus NZX will be the same way. My guess is the math will work out the same way. That would be slightly more expensive to go through the co-op. We'll see. But it's still a great deal. It's, those are great. You want both arrows in your quiver, and you want to be able to look at them both and say, which one is the best do for me right now? <laughs>